APG. Fisse les yeux sur le maître. As, as they were singing that, turn your eyes upon Jesus, actually I, I thought of feast your eyes on Jesus. I mean, Jesus is such an extraordinary person. It's like, it's like don't just look at him, feast on him. Drink him in, take him in, see what this person is. That's who he is. And you know, it's so exciting. We're going through the book of Luke in, in, this, uh, in this series. And today we'll be looking at Luke chapter 3. And Jesus is such an extraordinary person. No one in history has been like him. And last, last week, we looked at how John uh, and Jesus, they came on the scene right at the right time. Just when, when prophecies said, look for the Messiah at this time. And Jesus came right when the prophecies, hundreds of years old, said he would appear. And he was preceded by John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was not an ordinary fellow either. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Luke chapter 3, we're going to look a little bit at the ministry of John the Baptist. And so uh, as we prepare to launch into that, why don't we have a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, this was an extraordinary time. Things were being set up at this time that we're reading about in Luke chapter 3. The forerunner to Jesus was called on the scene to announce this special person who came for us. I pray, Lord, as, as, we, as we examine now this ministry of John, help us to understand a little bit more about what's important. Communicate to us through the words of John the Baptist now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's 6.30 on Friday morning. Imagine David is in bed. His alarm clock goes off. Beep, beep, beep. 6.30 in the morning. He hits the snooze button to get nine more minutes of shut-eye. After it goes off again, he gets up, takes a shower, eats breakfast, goes to work, and delivers packages around the city from 8 to 5. Now it's the weekend. David's friend has invited him to go visit this modern-day John the Baptist fellow type of fellow that's, that's preaching out by a lake. David thinks, okay, that's, I know I have something's missing in my life. I'll go, I'll go with you and see what, what's taking place. And so David and his friend Jeff go and visit this modern-day John the Baptist fellow. And David is convicted by the message, repents, he's baptized. David is now happy. He's a new person. Now it's Monday morning, 6.30 in the morning again. The alarm clock goes off. David hits a snooze button. Nine more minutes of shut eye. He gets up, takes a shower, eats breakfast, and goes to work where he delivers packages around the city from eight to five. What happened? What's the difference? I mean, what happened with 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 David? He's a new person, right? Post baptism. And yet, when you look at, at the before and after picture, it's like, well, where's the difference? That's what John the Baptist helps us to understand. John the Baptist. Remember, he was called by the angel Gabriel. The angel Gabriel actually came to his father, Zechariah, and said, you're going to bear a son. You're going to have a son, a miraculous son. You and your, your wife... Old in age, beyond childbearing age, you're going to have this, ama this amazing, miraculous boy. And he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And then around 30 years later, John the Baptist emerges on the scene and he starts preaching. In Luke chapter 3, verse 3, it says, 
He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John the Baptist went around now, all the country around that river Jordan, and he told the people that, that were there, he says, there's something wrong with you. There is something fundamentally wrong with you. You are unclean. You are separated from God. You need to get fixed. You need to reestablish. You need to establish a relationship with God by repenting, getting forgiveness for your sins, and being baptized. This is an extraordinary message. I mean, this, this sort of thing was never done before. John the Baptist broke on the scene as a unique individual in history. And I think he may have been caught a little off guard. I mean, here he was going telling people, you guys, you are, you're broken, you're wrong, you're, there's something wrong with you guys. And what happened? It says a bunch of people came out to visit him. He did everything wrong according to popular, good speaking techniques, right? I mean, when, when someone is speaking to an audience, now, an audience, they come, they, they've, they've taken their time, maybe they've paid money in order to get there, They're, uh, uh, they've gone through efforts to go listen to a speaker, and usually a good speaker will start off by first thanking the people that come out, Say, that's great. You guys are special people. You've come out and listened. And, and, and then the speaker will, will say something that, that connects them in common and be able to speak with, with, with his audience or her audience. John the Baptist didn't do that. He said, you guys, you're all rotten jerks. You're, you're, you're terrible people. And yet, it says, crowds went up to them. Very curious. Luke chapter 3, verse 8. No, uh, verse 7. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. I mean, John didn't compliment the people like a good speaker should do. John went out of his way to find the lowest form of life he could think of. And he said, You bunch of snakes. Why on earth did you come out here? That's a pretty curious way to address someone seeking some help. You are, you're just bad people, he says. You're broken. There's something wrong with you. Who told you to come out here? And, you know, I, I think one of the fundamental truths is we kind of know we're broken. I mean, John didn't need to tell him that. We know that. We know that, that innately we're, we do things selfishly. We know that, that we're not really the, the absolute best of people. We know that. And yet, we're really good at making excuses too. It's like, well, I may not be the best person, but at least I'm not breaking the law. At least I'm not like those other people, those other people. Crooks and robbers and thieves like that. John goes on, verse, verse 8. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. Back to our fictional character, David who uh, gets up every morning and delivers packages, or maybe even, to make it more real, think of, of you and me. It's like, we all know that we should be more committed to our relationship with God. We all know that we're, we're selfish, we don't really care enough about other people. We give maybe our church offerings, you know, we say, well, we're, we're not too bad. 